and say thank you for that lovely sound service as per usual from our brethren there in Chin City. Okay, I want to welcome you back to, well, is the final lecture in the camp series for 2022. And um, it has fallen on me to make that presentation. You know, in cricketing parlance, the 11th man is not the best batsman. He's usually standing at number 11 because he's not able to bat so well. But it is not about mind batting. I believe it's about Christ's teaching. And this evening, I want to invite you to, with mind still open and rejoicing in the kind of light and truth that God has again brought to our attention, especially for the purpose of climaxing his work at this time in the world, knowing that there are just a few hours remaining in life's history, in well, the earth's history. So I hope then that this evening as we listen, the spirit of God being the teacher of his people might write deeply upon our hearts and we might not be resistant in our surrender. So I invite you at this time to just pause for a short word of prayer as we get going for the evening. Our gracious Father, we adore you. We praise you. We thank you for your eternal mercies and your tenderness towards the children of men. In Christ Jesus, dear Lord, we have the assurance that we are accepted by you and we just want to rejoice in this fact. Be with us this evening and cause that only your voice might be heard in our souls and everything else would be hushed and the surrender of our souls be such that we will bring honor to your name. Thank you, Father. In your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, um, of course, you know, for the past well, the sixth lecture this is now, I have particularly been looking at when, then the end shall come. And this evening, we are also continuing that theme to finish with that particular team, theme. And the theme for this evening is the end and death. And it's very obvious that Death will bring the end for those who are, of course, not part of God's kingdom. But there's a death that we all must suffer if we are to be part of God's kingdom. And this is what I want to share with us today, very importantly. Our key text is 1 Corinthians 15, 26. It's a small text, simple, apparently. It says, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So death is an enemy. Therefore, it is, it will be destroyed in the end as the last enemy that shall be destroyed. I say death is an enemy, and more than just an enemy, it is the last enemy. You know what I'm God's children will rejoice and are rejoicing that death will be no more. No more separation as a result of that horrible, um, I dare say, experience. Now, Satan is also an enemy, but not the last enemy. And he will also be destroyed by the last enemy. So the destruction of Satan will be by the last enemy. Death itself will bring death to him. Amazing. So it's not God that brings death to him, you know. Death itself will annihilate Satan, but we will see where I'm going. Now, Satan, as far as I'm concerned, did not know what he was doing when he rebelled or sinned and pitted himself against Jehovah the only source of life. He did not really understand what he really was doing. 
Now, Proverbs 8, 35 tells us about all those that hate me love death. And James 1, 13 to 15, a text that we all are very aware of, also tells us about this death. And I read it just to get started. 13 to 15 says, let no man say when he is tempted of God, and, and when, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust or desires and enticed. And then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bring forth death. So death is the end result of everything. And when death is destroyed, that system will completely be destroyed. And only the system of God's grace, his righteousness, and as we have been looking at, beneficence will obtain in the entire universe. So thank God, death will be destroyed. Praise the Lord. Now, though death is the last enemy, we are encouraged to die. And this is very interesting. And we are also told that except we die, we cannot live. This is a, what paradox is this? It's the last enemy, yet we are told that we must die. And that except we die, we cannot live. What is this apparent conundrum that we find ourselves in? Death is the enemy, but we're told that we must die. And if we do not die, we cannot live. <laughs> Interesting, eh? But we let's go. Listen to Christ's words, John 12, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Unless a grain of wheat fall into the ground and died, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bring forth much fruit. Praise the Lord. What a paradox. No one wants to die. But we are told, except you die, basically you can't live. And my question to you, as I would say, is have you died? Are you dead? And hence, and therefore, are you alive? This is the experience that God's children must have. One, have died, but yet must be still living. How does this really occur? And my question to us is, with all the knowledge that we have gained, with all the understanding of God's character, he still requires that we die so that we might live. And he is not the author of death, but he still tells us we must die. But let's get going. But the death of which I speak is the death of self. Bishop? I was just asking, I'm sorry for the impediment, if you could just increase the font a little bit for us, please. Or the size. Thank you. Okay. Better? Wonderful. Okay. All right. So I'm saying now that we are told, or this death of which we speak, is the death to self. And this is the most difficult death that anyone can experience. You know, and people are slaughtered by gunshots, by knives, by bombs, by various implements, really, that take them out. But this death of which I speak is a different kettle of fish, I mean, there are user expression. Because as we're going to see, which you know already, we should be reminded of, and we go a little deeper into it, this death must be performed by you. And by the way, it's not the suicide as per usual. But you must kill yourself. Wow, is that true? 
I want you to just think a little bit as I mentioned that thought. It is not suicide as we know it in this life, but it is a more serious and consequential death if we are to live. And the question I just want to pose to us again, are you dead? Or are you living, posing that you're dead, the kind of death to which I refer? Now, in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, the apostle Paul tells us about dying daily. You must die daily. So it seems as if this self is so pervasive that if death does not occur daily, we shall not be able to experience life. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, Christ said, Paul says, I declare by my rejoicing in you, and now he's telling me rejoice in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. So apparently this daily dying is a rejoicing. But you and I know that death is not anything anybody rejoices in. But here Paul says, I declare by my rejoice in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. You know, are we going to realize that this daily death is the most difficult death to die? And yet we are called to die it. But Christ himself tells us. That except a person die, as did Paul, that he repudiate, reject, renounce his own life, he cannot be his disciple. So if we do not die and die daily, we can't be Christ's disciples, you know. And we're going to see actually fact what this dying really entails as we go a little further. But my challenging question to you is, have you died? And more than that, when last did you die? Since it's a daily dying, the question I think is appropriate. When was the last time you died? Listen to Christ in Luke 4, 26, 14, 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, what is Christ teaching here? Of course, we are very familiar with this in terms of what it says. But are we familiar with what it asks us, what it asks of us? Hate mother and father and wife and children, brethren and sisters, your own life. And that's the point we're at. Except you hate your own life. You cannot be the disciple of Christ. You know what that involves? This life that we glory in so much. This thinking that we are so important. And Christ is saying, listen, if that doesn't, if that is not hated by you, that body of sin which you're going to get to is not hated by you, you cannot be his disciple. And my question to us is, Oh, how we are so proud of who we are. Of our accomplishments, quote unquote. We don't really hate ourselves. And I want to suggest to you, that being so, you are not a disciple of Christ. What does Christ mean, hating yourself, your mother, your father, your children, your brethren, your wife and sisters? Yes, it means what I am speaking about. And I'm not speaking anything. I'm the fancy word as a territory, you know, already fancy and big. I am getting to the bottom of what I believe is the most crucial thing that we need to experience at this time. It entails the character of God. 
also. But it must occur before we can experience the character of God. That is death to self. And I ask the question again, are you sure, am I sure that I am dead to self? Or is that just a cliche expression we use to make ourselves believe that we are Christians? Except we die to self. Not only that we cannot, but we are not Christ's disciples. And that is why the last enemy to be destroyed before we are able to see the face of Christ is self, selfishness, which is, as we're going to see, so tricky that when we think we are dead to it, it has gotten a march on us and is still living in us. And I want you to keep that in mind. I know I repeat it, I might be sound like a stock record this evening, but I believe that the Spirit of God has indicted on my soul to speak this matter this way. I want us to now go into the Bible and we're going to read from Romans chapter 6, 1 to 11. Romans 6, 1 to 11. And I'm going to ask two persons to read for me. Listen carefully. I don't want the reading other than solemnly realizing that it's the word of God that we're reading. We must read with the understanding and the respect that is due to God's word. Sometimes we just read and it is smoke to the eye, just rushing as it were. But I want us to read contemplatively because a lot that we want to bring out by God's grace from these portion of these 11 verses. So two persons read as, as we would say with pathos, with solemnity, with understanding of what we're reading, and I don't want Russian people and persons that I haven't heard for the time that I was presenting, I will want you, some of you to read, not those who regularly read, but I want you to read with understanding this evening because there's much that we want to get at. So someone can read from verse one to verse five, and then other person from verse six to 11. Have any takers, please? I'll read. Go Shall ahead. Okay, well, this is Sister Sophia, reading from the King James. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in seeing that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not? that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, okay. that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we should also live with him. Knowing that Christ may raise from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. 
For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus our Lord. Thank you both. And um, this portion of scripture begs for a very serious introspection. And this isn't anything that we could just gloss over and feel that we have it. Except we experience it, we do not have it. And listen to what the Apostle Paul says here. How, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Are we continuing in sin just for grace to abound, brethren? But no further, how shall we who are dead to sin? Ah, we can substitute the word self here in the place of sin. There's going to be some substitution we're going to do in this portion for self, because basically it is what it is. How shall we who are dead to self? That what sin is, of course, we can talk about the body of sin, which is self. So how shall we who are dead to sin or to self live any longer therein? What, do, what, what is the apostle telling us? Are we still going to, are we still manifesting these sinful, selfish habits that we claim to be dead to? Wanting to be important, wanting to be the first, wanting to be able to say, I this, I that. Is that what death to self is all about? That is living to self. But listen to what the apostle, and, and a lot of death talk is in this portion, hence I want to share it. Know that as many of you who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. So if we are truly baptized into Christ, we are baptized into his death, you know, the death of self, the death to self. I'm not just talking about going into the water because that should be illustrative of the experience of death that we had even before we reached the water. But you and I know that many of us have just gone into the water, but we have not died to self. Self is still kicking and rearing after so many years of claiming to have been baptized. Then another point here in verse four. Therefore, if you're buried with him by baptism, into death, again, into death, the death of Christ. Just as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, and that's who, who he was raised up, we also shall walk in newness of life. So if we have died to Christ, and we can get the point that Christ dies no more, it means if we have died to Christ, we too are risen with him, and we die no more, therefore sin self does not dominate us anymore. But can we honestly say that we are not dominated by sin and that we die daily? I want you to consider those thoughts, you know. But going further, because time usually slips very quickly. Verse 5, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, the likeness of his death. What is the likeness of Christ's death? If we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, death to self, that's what it is. It's not just merely going into the tomb as he did, and that was truly the, 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 um, the quintessence of death to self, because he did not even seek to save himself from that death. So what I'm saying to us, brethren, Have we been planted in the likeness of that death, death to self? Or I repeat again, for fear of being said that I am boring people, have you just went into water called a baptism, but you didn't really die, or I didn't really die? Then he says, knowing this, now this is interesting, I like to really work on that word, knowing. 
Now, when we talk about knowing, what are we talking about? He said, knowing this, that is, you know by experience that your old man is crucified. That is what Paul is intimating here from the spirit of God. Do you know if your old man, and by the way, the old man again is self. That's what the old man is, you know. Self, sin. Do you know that fact that your old man is crucified? Is it a fact that you as individual, your old man's self is crucified? And then verse seven is a beautiful thought I want to share, which you all are very familiar with. I'm not trying to bring anything new. I'm just trying to bring to our attention the dire situation we are in if we claim that we are dead and not dead with Christ. Listen to what Paul says, and this is the acid test of whether or not we are dead. I want you to bear this in mind. If you hear nothing else from me during the series, bear this particular verse in mind. Like I said, it's the acid test whether or not you're dead. For he that is dead is freed from sin. That's amazing. Question to myself and to you. Have you been freed and are you free from sin? Hello? You see, we're talking about Christ. And in Christ, that is the experience. Having died with him and been resurrected, We now are freed from sin if we have had that death with Christ. Do you still find yourself locked up and rock, locked up and rock up in sin, but yet saying that we are dead with Christ? And this is what these kind of thoughts should bring to our attention. What does all of that mean? We're going to explore in a very short while free from sin because of death with Christ. Again, Paul goes on talking about death, and this is a beautiful chapter about the death of self, which is the last death that must occur to the people of God to enter the kingdom of God. Unlike that final death that will come to those who reject Christ, they will go into oblivion so that that death must also occur before they go into oblivion, just like our death must occur before we enter the kingdom of God. And then he says, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more, death has no more dominion over him. Death has no more dominion over the man who is dead in Christ. That's why Christ told Martha, I am the resurrection of life. Though a person dies, yet they shall live because he, he is the life. And then verse 11. I like it. Likewise, reckon ye also yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see, in actual fact, we must reckon count ourselves to be dead. Now, the question is, how does one count himself to be dead? By just saying, well, one, two, three, four, I count myself dead? Of course, it means reckon, consider, I dare say, that you are dead unto sin, but because of Jesus, you are alive unto God, our oh Lord. So the question is, have you reckoned yourself to be dead recently? When last did you say, as you go on your journey in the mornings, I am dead and Christ is living in me today. That is, I die daily. And let me tell you something. Don't think that I'm, think, don't think to say that Elder Graves is just saying, you must say those words. What Elder Graves is saying, you must experience those words. Death to self. So that when attacks come during the day, because self is dead, that is you, yourself, is dead, Christ manifests himself because he's alive in us. So 
So yes, when last did you die? And are you dead now? Or are you quibbling over what is being said, demonstrating that, that, that you're not dead to self? God alone knows whether or not you are dead and you yourself know whether or not you are dead. But you may not want to accept it that you're not dead. But the word of God. Listen carefully now to what I said I want to share for a while. And I keep on kept keeping it back until this point. I want you to really think about what is being said. These words are very interesting. Death to self. Listen carefully. When you are forgotten or neglected or purposely set at naught, and you do not sting and hurt at the oversight, but your heart is happy, being counted worthy to suffer for Christ. That is death to self. And I like it. When you're forgotten, neglected, or purposely set at naught, and you do not sting and hurt at the oversight. We know this experience. But they even pay me attention to oversight, you overlooking me. Come on, brethren, that is not death to self. You are living. I am living if that's my experience. But further, when your good is evil spoken of, when your wishes are crossed, your advice disregarded, your opinions ridiculed, and you refuse to let anger rise in your heart, or even defend yourself, but take it all in patient, loving silence. That is death to self. Do you know that experience? Especially defending yourself, refusing to defend yourself, or even allow anger to rise in your heart, to who your advice might be disregarded as a parent, as a spouse, as a child, especially parents and spouses, will you pay me attention? Should you get antsy? If you can still take it in patient, loving silence, that's illustration of death to self. But how many of us experience that? We must have the last word, don't we? And if you don't have the last word, the people don't care about me. I say that is not death to self. When you lovingly and patiently bear any disorder, any irregularity, and any unpunctuality, or any annoyance, when you can stand face to face with waste, folly, extravagance, spiritual insensibility, and endure it as Jesus endured it, that is death to self. When you are content with any food, any offering, any raiment, any climate, any society, any solitude, any interruption by the will of God, that is death to self. When you care never to be referred to, sorry, when you care never to refer to yourself in conversation, or to record your own good works, or itch after commendation. When you can truly love to the unknown, that is death to self. Anybody identifying anything about themselves as yet? Am I identifying anything about myself? But listen further, this gets deeper. When you can receive correction and reproof, Listen now, from one of less stature than yourself, uh, humbly submit inwardly as well as outwardly, finding no rebellion or resentment raising up within your heart, that is death to self. Think about that. You know, we are told that We should be able to learn from even children, that is adults. But how often we resent 
Not only children, now sometimes a child tells us something, you, you think, oh, that is cute. But if somebody in your estimation, my estimation, who we might think is of a lesser stature than me, how dare you correct me? That is an acid test. When people who we do not consider of consequence dare to correct or say something that will sting you, are you able to bear it both inwardly and outwardly? Sometimes you might put on a face on the outward expression, but inside is burning like a raging fire. And this brethren, you know, you know, in my estimation, as I read this particular thing, it really brought me clear, clearly to what we've just read in Romans chapter six. Except you are dead, you will never take correction from somebody who you believe is less than you. And by the way, no one is less than you or me. That is our estimation by the world. And that's the world standard. And that shows you're not dead either because you're allowing the world standard to be your standard. But the character of God, we say glibly and lovely. This is a demonstration, as I would call it, a, a, a running commentary of what the character of God is all about. So all that we are saying, if self is not dead, we do not know the character of God. But then as I conclude this thought here, I want to read Sister White. A couple of thoughts, because I realize time is very, very short and I have to take it. I refer back to this last point. Listen to Ellen White. This comes from Volume 5 of Testimonies, page 204, paragraph 2. Christ please not himself. Let us honest up with ourselves. How often we please ourselves? Not every day. And if, therefore, Christ pleasing not himself, and he did it every day, meant that he was dead every day. We pleasing ourselves every day mean that we are not dead every day. Listen to she say, what she says further. He did nothing for himself. His work was in behalf of fallen man. What do we do in behalf of fallen humanity? Or we do everything for ourselves. We seek to get, whether it's money, a bigger house, a bigger car, more expensive things, so that the status quo, or, or, or it will be part of the status quo that we recognize, hey, you know, this person is moving on. But what are we doing for persons? Are we praying in earnest for persons and not just copying up, quote unquote, using the expression, merely praying? Do we go to them? Do we lend a helping hand? What do we do for our neighbors? I'm not even thinking about household as yet, but for our neighbors who we see in need. Christ did not please himself, brethren. He was dead to self. Listen further. Selfish stood abash in his presence. That is selfishness stood abash, stood ashamed in Christ's presence. Selfishness was ashamed. It couldn't handle the presence of Christ. With us, does it enjoy your presence? And you know, brethren, you and I know very well, we are very selfish people. And except Christ be in us, and we are dead. Selfishness is us personified. Selfishness took a bash in his presence. He assumed our nature that he might suffer in our sake. Now listen to this on the line part. Selfishness or sin we could interchange again. The sin of the world has become the prevailing sin of the church. What a thing is this? Whether it is 
showing that you can sing well. And for God's sake, you should be saying well, but not for sure. Not to be commended and say, boy, you're good, you know. No, 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 no. Selfishness must stand abash in the presence of the one who is dead to it. Selfishness, the sin of the world, has become the prevailing sin of the church. The truth of church, if you don't see selfishness walking up and down and parading in it. We're talking about death to self. We are just gloating in self. And if not given up, we will die too with that self, with that sin, the last death. In sacrificing himself for the good of men, Christ strikes at the root of all selfishness. You hear that? When you sacrifice like Christ yourself for the good of others, it is striking at the root of all selfishness. Do we know that? Do we strike at the root of selfishness in our hearts? By sacrificing ourselves for the good of others. And we can sacrifice ourselves for the good of others by defending persons when they're on failure attack. That is a form of sacrificing yourself. Standing up for those, like we read in Luke chapter 4, what Christ did. When he came to deliver those who are captive, who have been unfairly treated. And you and I know that very often we unfairly treat people. We do not stand up for the right. Somehow we believe that if a person has what we call status, we should gravitate to them. But that is not standing for the right. Standing for the right is a principle in spite of who is offended. Do we stand for the right for the weakest among us? Or do we throw them under the bus? We know what we are, I am talking about. I know what I'm talking about. Do I stand for the weak ones? Or do we overlook them? As per usual, they're not consequential. So they're not benefiting me. Like some people like to say, you know, that, that don't benefit me, so I can't deal with that. Is that like Christ, brethren? You can answer me. You know. And therefore, this character of God's message, except it bursts out of our cranium just talking about it. We don't know the character of God. We don't know the righteousness of Christ. How do you treat your in-laws? How do you treat your relatives? How do you treat people like that? Overlook them. Sometimes don't even have a pleasant word for them. A word of encouragement. I'm not saying you, are saying me, we. This message is for you and for me, you know. But yet we say we are dead to self. Now let me tell you something, brethren. Sharp as it might sound, the vast majority of us are not dead. And therefore, we are not in Jesus Christ. You can challenge that. But I want to conclude. I will read you this statement I have here. Just to conclude this statement, Sister White. When you can receive correction and reproof from one of less statue, and I emphasize that, less statue than yourself, and can humbly submit inwardly as well as outwardly, finding no rebellion or resentment rising up within you, within your heart, that is death to self. And then I conclude with this statement from Council of the Church, page 41, paragraph 4. I find it very apt here. I have seen an angel standing with scales in his hands, weighing the thoughts and interests of the people of God, especially the young. In one scale were the thoughts and interests tending heavenward, in the other were the thoughts and interests tending to earth. And in this scale, the one tending to earth were thrown all the reading of storybooks, thoughts of dress and show, 
vanity, pride, etc. Oh, what a solemn moment. The angels of God standing with scales wearing the thoughts of his professed people, children. Those who claim to be dead to the world and alive to God. The scale filled with thoughts of earth, vanity, and pride quickly went down. It was heavy. Notwithstanding, weight after weight rolled from the scale. Even though some of the weight was rolling off, the scale was still going down. It was so heavy. The one with the thoughts and interests tending to heaven went quickly up as the other went down. And these are the old balance scales. And oh, how light it was. I can relate this as I saw it, but never can I give the solemn and vivid impression stamped upon my mind. As I saw the angel with the scales weighing the thoughts and interests of the people of God. Listen to this. Said the angel, can such enter heaven? No, no, never. Tell them the hope they now possess is vain. And unless they speedily repent and obtain salvation, they must perish. Unless they speedily repent, like the publican, acknowledge that they are publican and crow for mercy and obtain salvation, they must perish. May these words would have written and have been seared in our consciences. Causing us to went to Christ to die in him that we might live by his life. I want to invite you to pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we just want to say thanks to you because of your great love. And we see there, Lord, that out of your heart of love, you send these thoughts to us so that we might Repent speedily and obtain salvation so that we might not perish. Oh, Father, I beseech you that no one might leave this place thinking that they are all right and yet living for self. Denying our Lord who gave himself for us. Thank you for knowing our hearts. And thank you for showing us Jesus our greatest need. Thank you, Father, in his precious name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you very much, Elder W. Austin Graves. The solemn importance of death to self so that only God is manifested in Christ. And it ties in and brings to a conclusion all of our formal lectures. But the character of God is self-sacrificing love. And for us to truly experience that character, we must experience the self-sacrificing love of the gospel, which crucifies the I. So I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live yet. Not I, but Christ liveth in me. A very timely message. Thank you very much. Indeed. Death to self, only God in Christ appears. And that is so, in fact, we will glorify God in the final crisis as Christ glorified him on earth. Again, thanks very much. Well, that was our last lecture, formal lecture for the camp. Ahead of us now, the book, camp book study. And then, uh, of course, tonight, our closing ceremony. So take a five-minute break. And we will then move into our groups and proceed with our 
camp book group study, five minute break, and then we will come back and go straight into our groups. God bless. Thank you. You too.